am Kathleen Danielson, and I'm going to talk about improving diversity in OpenStreetMap. A uh, quick introduction, I am a developer advocate at MapZen. I am on the board of directors of the OpenStreetMap Foundation, and I am on the advisory board of the ADA initiative, which I will talk about later. So what am I talking about? What do I mean when I say I want to talk about diversity? Um, I want to talk about things like gender diversity, racial diversity, sexual orientation and gender identity, disability, socioeconomic status. Um, I am primarily going to focus on uh, gender diversity today. Uh, that's what I know the most about. It's what I'm most qualified to speak on. Um, many, many, many things that I talk about today will be applicable to all these other categories. Um, and they, uh, the way I kind of will frame this is uh, from a feminist perspective, but particularly uh, intersectional feminism, meaning that uh, you can be in favor of uh, equality for women while not, uh, not at the expense of other marginalized groups. Uh, if you feel like learning more about this, which you should, uh, this book, Feminism is for Everybody by Bell Hooks, is basically the primer on the subject. So open source has a problem, and actually it has a couple problems. First one that I want to talk about is the problem of implicit power structures. Open source is a very unstructured thing, and it is that way by design. The problem comes when that, uh, that lack of structure uh, goes into the social workings. Any group of people ever has a power structure. That's just how people work. In open source, what you end up doing usually is you replace that power structure that normally stated out loud, this is who is managing what, and you replace it with an implicit power structure where nobody knows who's managing what, unless you're already part of the cool club, unless you're already on the inside. If you're not, good luck getting in. Suggested reading for this is a wonderful essay called The Tyranny of Structurelessness uh, by Joe Freeman. It was published in the early 70s, uh, talking about the feminist movement at the time. It's Wonderful. Um, what happens with that structurelessness is that privileged groups end up rising to the top. Um, privilege can end up being a trigger word for some people. Um, it makes people feel defensive, um, and I get that. Open source has a lot of interplay between privileged and marginalized groups, and if you want to learn more about this, which again, you should, John Scalzi has a really wonderful uh, blog post, actually a series of blog posts, on um, explaining what privilege is and what it means and what it doesn't mean. And then open source also has an unequal distribution of funds. I think there's a story we tell ourselves about how open source is a cash neutral game. These are volunteer projects, everyone's just doing them for fun, it's free, and therefore there's no money in it. That's not true. Look at the conference around you, look at um, all sorts of other open source, uh, open communities. This is not a cash neutral economy. So OpenStreetMap is not immune to these problems. OpenStreetMap absolutely falls under the umbrella of tech and open source, even if it's more of an open data project. But we'll actually talk about that a little bit, too. So one more suggested reading. Uh, my colleague, Alyssa Wright, uh, gave a talk two years ago at this conference called The Threads of OSM Discussion. Are the doors really open? It was a really good analysis of um, diversity in tech and what that looks like in, through the lens of OpenStreetMap. So what I'm not discussing today, um, I'm not going to prove to you that there's a problem. If you, do, if you don't believe me, you're probably not going to like the rest of the talk anyway. I'm not going to talk about the pipeline. Um, pipeline issues are important, but they are something I think, sometimes they are used as a way to derail conversations about toxic environments. And it doesn't matter if we have an amazing pipeline if the environment that we're dumping people into is unhealthy. And I'm also not going to talk about geographic or linguistic diversity. These are things that are really important to OpenStreetMap. Um, they fall into some slightly different categories than some of the um, subjects I mentioned already. Um, the, so I'm not going to talk about those. The other thing is that I often find them coming up as derailing tactics. Um, even though they are very important, people like to bring them up in a way when you're talking about diversity because it is less uncomfortable to talk about something like geographic diversity than to talk about racial diversity or gender diversity. So I'm not talking about that. 
So there's a lot that is happening in the tech industry. Um, diversity in tech is something uh, it's, that's on everybody's lips. Everyone's talking about it. A lot's going on, and there's a lot we can learn. There are a couple different types of organizations and communities and um, programs doing things um, in different ways. One of those ways is by building new communities. Um, people, they, there are communities that are created that, I'm sure that there's probably an actual word for this, but I decided to just call it communities of identity, where you're creating, um, these are gonna be like women who code or Latinas in tech, um, not, those both might be things. Let, let, anyway, um, the, the value in having these communities of identity is that you're building communication channels, um, you're providing access to networks for people who traditionally have been left out of those. The other thing that's really, really valuable in these communities is that you enable people to spot and combat uh, problems that are much, much harder to notice and much, much harder to recognize as problematic when you're in isolation. Um, so you can see things like where maybe one incident isn't sexist or isn't racist, but you know what, this sort of thing happens in all, like this sort of happens over and over, it's you know recurring, maybe it's only happened to me once, but it has also happened to eight of my friends. Um, that's a really, really powerful thing as well. So communities that are essentially adjacent to larger ones that are creating this community of identity, um, these are groups and organizations like Black Girls Code, Rails Girls, Django Girls, Pi Ladies, Trans Hack. These are all doing that sort of thing of creating these communities of identity um, which provide resources and networking um, to groups that traditionally have been left out of that. So in addition to uh, creating new communities, other groups work on improving existing communities. Probably my favorite example of this is the Boston Python workshop. Um, this was created by people uh, in the Boston Python user group. They uh, created a workshop for women to learn uh, Python and then specifically designed it to integrate those uh, new uh, Pythonistas into the local user group. So they were very specifically working on improving the diversity of the existing community rather than creating an auxiliary community. There are pros and cons to doing things both ways, but they were very specific about what they wanted to do, and what they wanted to do was improve the Python community. Um, another thing that was really neat about the uh, Boston Python workshop was that the, the Python Software Foundation provided that group, that initial group, with grants to go and implement this workshop in other communities around, I think around the US, it could have been international as well, not positive. Uh, another group that works on improving ex existing communities is Outreachy. Outreachy uh, used to be the GNOME Outreach Program for Women. Uh, they recently rebranded. They changed. They're not just focused on women. They, all, they, uh, they support uh, trans and cisgendered women and trans men and I think LGBT people and uh, the people from the Ascend group. But basically, it's essentially, it's Google Summer of Code, but for diversity. For, and um, it, it pairs up interns with open source projects, pairs them with a mentor, um, provides funding for them, which is the really important part. Um, and Outreachy, uh, OpenStreetMap, we are actually working with them. Um, HOT has, is now in their second round with, um, with Outreachy and OSM has, now has their first interns from uh, Outreachy what I just said. Um, okay, and the, the final group of, uh, the final type of project is one that isn't really building a community, but is, is, is instead providing resources. Uh, one of my favorite examples is the ADA initiative uh, that I'm on the advisory board for. Um, the ADA initiative has done a lot of work around supporting implementation of encouraging the adoption of codes of conduct at tech conferences. Um, they also provide imposter syndrome trainings, um, then ally skills workshops, which are um, really neat ways to kind of, for people who want who want to be good allies but don't know how. Um, how do you do things like recognize bad behavior? How do you call that out? Um, especially because you're usually in a better position to do that than whatever marginalized person is there. Um, and then they also provide ADA camps, which are small um, unconferences for women in open tech and culture uh, that they hold around the world. And those provide some more of that value, that um, those communities of identity. Another example, and this is uh, closely tied, closely related to the ADA initiative, is the Geek Feminism Wiki. Um, this is exactly, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a wiki of geek feminism. It's uh, got one, one really important thing it has is a timeline of incidents. When you talk about 
um, sexism or uh, racism in in tech, um, you get a lot of pushback on, well, like this isn't really a problem or our community doesn't have this problem. And by starting to write them down and say, you know what, this, yes, there are incidents every day, every month, every conference, starting to write them down across the industry, you see these trends and it's a really powerful um, thing. And it's a very powerful thing for people who are using it. Um, the Geek Feminism Wiki also provides uh, great Feminism 101, essentially, which you can send people to or use yourself. For, for myself, I think as a, as a baby feminist, I felt like the Geek Feminism Wiki was really, really useful because it just it was this really accessible place for me to learn all sorts of things, things that I didn't know have names. Um, it gave me vocabulary for things I was experiencing that I didn't know were weird. Um, and it does this by, it does things like outlining um, patterns of, uh, of harassers or abusers, um, things like silencing techniques, um, derailing tactics, explaining things like what is gaslighting, um, things that are very subtle and are intentionally very subtle. And when you're in isolation, you don't know how to spot them. So a resource like the Geek Feminism Wiki is pooling these resources for groups that normally wouldn't have access to them. Um, Wikimedia is one more that I want to mention, and Wikimedia is really important because there is no other project that parallels OpenStreetMap um, socially the way that Wikimedia does. Um, no open source software project can ever have the same parallels that we have with Wikimedia. Um, Wikimedia is doing interesting diversity work. They, um, they have certainly found that among their editors there is a lack of diversity um, that they really need to, to do something about. and. Um, so they have, they've built up a lot of resources on shocking wikis. They, um, so you can go in and you can see kind of what their uh, gender gap task force is working on. Um, they, work, they have different surveys, especially to see what, how successful their initiatives have been. Um, there's, lots of, there's lots of academic scholarship about uh, Wikipedia and in, within that lots about uh, diversity within Wikipedia and it's all there, you can find all of that. Okay, so I sort of promised a very like action-oriented talk, and so far I have provided zero actions for any of you. I'm going to change that. So what about OSM? What's, what's going on with, with the project we're working on? Um, we're already actually doing quite a bit. Um, there are codes of conduct at uh, several conferences. So the one you're at right now has a very good code of conduct. Um, last year's State of the Map in DC was the first State of the Map US with a code of conduct. Um, I was involved in planning that, helped uh, put that code of conduct in place. Um, travel grants, there have been travel grants for the last, this is the fourth conference to have, uh, fourth state of the map US to have travel grants, um, and increasingly more of those grants tend to be earmarked for marginalized uh, people. There is a diversity mailing list, and I don't know if many of you know this, but actually uh, last fall, the OpenStreetMap community raised um, over $2,000 for the ADA initiative in 36 hours. Um, because I was like, hey, we should do this, and it was a day and a half before their fundraising drive closed. So maybe I'll do that earlier than 36 hours this year. Um, okay, so that's sort of the stuff we're already doing, but what next? I want to provide a quick caveat that what I don't want to be advocating for is more invisible labor. I think that one of the worst things we do is we expect marginalized people to demarginalize themselves. and by, and we also tend to discount the work that goes into diversity efforts. So I tried, as I was pulling these together, to not be suggesting that someone take on any, any more unpaid labor, um, which is also an interesting thing within a volunteer context, but we can talk about that later. So this one seems really obvious, and I wish this was just like my whole slide and then I'd mic drop and leave, but we need to make our, these spaces healthier. Um, and what do I mean by that? Stop tolerating bad behavior. Stop tolerating bad behavior. Stop tolerating bad behavior. Codes of conduct are in place and are implemented because you need to have structure. You need to eliminate this in these implicit rules and provide guidance around what's acceptable. What I would like to see is uh, state of the map, um, the OpenStreetMap Foundation that uh, I'm on the board of. We have the trademark for uh, the state of the map. Um, this is something I've talked about with Kate, um, with some others. We'd, I think it would be great if we were creating a trademark policy that said basically you cannot be a state of the map if you do not have a solid code of conduct. 
Uh, I'd like to see the same for all mailing lists that are hosted by OpenStreetMap. Um, we've talked about this, some do, some sort of do, that sort of starts and then sort of peters out. I'd like to see it just be anything that's hosted by like our that Piper, Mail, Piper Mail server has a code of conduct. And then beyond that, just having these codes of conduct is a nice gesture, but it doesn't matter if you can't um, enforce them, if you can't implement them. And I think this is not something that just we struggle with. I think that across the tech industry, it's really a challenge to deal with um, how do you implement these things? Um, how do you enforce them? I think that we need, we need better plans for that. I think there need to be better resources about it. Um, so we need to stop tolerating bad behavior. We need to increase the access to funding. Like I said before, this is not a cash neutral project. Look at the conference you're at. There is money in this economy. So who is making a living off of this project? Who is doing work that is based upon OpenStreetMap, that is working towards with OpenStreetMap? And what does that distribution of funding look like? I would love to see, I would actually love to see research into this. Someone doing like a proper survey of where is the money in OpenStreetMap? Who has it? Who has access to it? Because I think you, the, the most obvious ones are going to be larger companies like MapZen, who I work for, Mapbox. Um, but there are lots of other people who are paid to work um, somewhere within the OSM ecosystem or in a way that is very related to OSM. And when you end up having one person, two people uh, at an organization, it's much harder to spot patterns. So I think if we were able to look at industry-wide, we would start to see where, how is that money distributed. And I feel very confident that it's not distributed in an equitable, equitable way. And then the last thing I want to kind of recommend that we do is I think we need to capture our experiences. And this is something I think that we can really learn from uh, Wikipedia and Wikimedia that they are writing down what they are experiencing, what they are working on. And I think that there are a lot of ways that we can do something really similar. So we have a wiki, and why don't we use it? I checked there is no diversity page on the wiki. So. Is there OSM diversity research? I think so. I don't really know. If we had a wiki page that just said, here, people have done this research, this stuff's about diversity, that would be pretty straightforward and then I would know. Um, I think also best practices and resources. I don't think that it makes sense for us to try to do something like, re, um, like rebuild the geek feminism wiki, but I think there are gonna be things that are very specific to what we're doing and resources that are helpful for us, and I think are especially gonna be finding them through Wikimedia. I want us to learn a lot more from them because we just, that's a, there's so many lessons learned there that we just don't take advantage of. Um, I think also something that would be really straightforward, really easy, is just do some greatest hits from the mailing list. Like, it's not like we never talked about diversity. We talk about diversity actually kind of a lot, but it goes into the mailing list and then it's out in the ether and then no one ever sees it again. Go find those links, put them in a list and say, here are these conversations we've had about diversity. Um, start looking at trends, see, you know, how do things go? What, you know, what's successful? What do, maybe there are things that we assume everybody disagrees on that actually, you know, not a lot of people do. Um, that's a really straightforward thing that we can do. And then another one I think would make a lot of sense is simply to track ongoing diversity projects, things like code of conduct um, implementation, because I think there are a lot of things where we started something, it petered out, started it, it petered out. And I don't think that tracking it is gonna make that not happen, but what it's gonna do is it's gonna show us patterns of, you know what, we tried to do this like four different times, it failed every time, we probably need to uh, reassess how we are approaching it. So the point I'm really trying to get across here today is that this problem's not too big. Yes, diversity is a, is a challenge, it's complex, um, there are a lot of there are a lot of moving pieces, but it's not too big, and we can do something about it. Talk about it. Is this something you care about? It. Tell your boards. Are you a member of the OpenStreetMap Foundation? You should be. And tell your boards. Tell me. Tell the rest of my fellow board members. Um, when the elections happen, make sure that people know that that's something you care about, and that you want people to be working. Uh, to improve diversity in OpenStreetMap. Better yet, run for the board yourself. There's also, um, in the US, there's the OSM US board. Um, same goes for them. Make sure that they know that's something you care about. Um, some other countries also have boards for their um, local chapters. Let people know that it's something you care about. Educate yourself. This is something I need to keep doing as well. 
but again, one of the worst thing, one of the things that we do is we say it is the responsibility of the marginalized groups to explain to me how they're marginalized. It, if you think about that for a second, it's ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. So educate yourself. Learn about this stuff, and don't be so oblivious, because that lets you then spot bad behavior and say something. We spend a lot of time tolerating bad behavior, and it's by being very passive we are making our priorities super, super clear. So let's change those priorities and make that super clear. Stop relying on invisible labor. Stop relying on people who are already, already don't have access to the same resources to build up um, an understanding of why they don't have access to these resources. Money talks. This is not a cash neutral economy. There are companies in this economy, there are organizations, there are uh, foundations that are very invested in this project. It's a valuable project. It is, and if that is something that you're involved in, if your company has money, put your money where your mouth is and work on improving diversity in OSM because it matters. Uh, if you want this project to be successful, it needs to not be a homogenous group of mappers. It needs to not be a homogenous group of developers who are working on it. And then finally, pay the experts. Um, I thought a lot about this as I was getting this talk ready. Did I want to suggest that we kind of put our own funding structures in place for things like microgrants or non-microgrants? And I think that there's a lot that can be done right now by supporting the organizations that already do this. There are people out there who are experts who do this across open source projects. They know what they're doing. They're very good at it. And I think if we say, we can run this internally, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take on this invisible emotional labor of running something where we're not necessarily the best equipped to do that. There are people out there who we can pay. Let's pay the aid initiative, get them to do ally skills training at a conference. Let's pay Outreachy, let's keep paying Outreachy um, to help us bring um, junior developers into, uh, into the ecosystem. So diversity matters, thanks. Um, before before Q and A starts, I'm just going to do one quick comment, which is if we're going to restrict it to questions and not comments, because I'll be around after this and I can talk to you about comments. And also, there's Twitter, and you can say all sorts of things to me on Twitter. Ideally, nicer things, but you know, it's Twitter. Um, okay. Um, how do you think this compares in the OSM community in general versus the general tech? Like, or is it better, or worse? How have you seen it so far? Um, I think there are some ways in which, um, there are some ways in which OSM, I think, is behind tech in general. Um, I tend to find that the conversations around diversity are, um, they're delayed, basically. They're, they're things that other communities were talking about one or two or three years ago. Um, so in that way, I think like the, the rhetoric is, um, is behind the times. I think in terms of numbers, I think for, to some extent because the rhetoric is behind the time, there's not as much, there hasn't been as much improvement in numbers. I don't have, I don't have good research at my fingertips. So, uh, you're right there. Um, I was just curious if you, if you see some of the efforts that you're proposing with OSM as part of a more general framework for other communities? Because OSM, I mean, it's not unique in the sense that there are many open source communities, and then there's even, you know, closed source communities that this stuff applies to, too. So do you think it's more effective that people within the, the organizations find their own way to, to do this, or do you think it is more effective on a general scale if we can all agree across the industry on a set of guidelines. I'm not sure if we can agree across the industry on how to improve diversity. Um, that would be lovely though. Uh, I think, I mean, I, I think a lot of what I'm saying is very applicable to different projects. Uh, also, different projects have their own special issues. Um, so I think what I'm saying around, like, we need to do a better job, we need to start capturing um, our experiences. We need, I think that for some communities, they, don't, they wouldn't necessarily need that. They, um, they're kind of in a better place now, or and for some communities they might like that might be too ambitious. Um, but
but certainly much of what I'm saying is very um, applicable to different different projects. Any other questions? Why don't you think that that's I'm going to defer that question just because I left geogra I intentionally left geographic diversity out. I think I mean basically I think it's important. We can talk about it after, but I want to set that aside because it's an entire master's thesis onto itself. Okay. All right. Uh, wait, was that one last question? Uh, what do you think about uh, just users that are anonymous and and you don't necessarily know like who's doing what or what they are or even if they're human or whatnot? I assume they're all cats. <laughs> um, I think that's great. I think that uh, there's no reason that people need to um, specify a gender. Uh, I don't even think there is any way to specify a gender with OSM. Um, I think it's perfectly fine, excellent, but they may be cats. All right, thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>